All right, it's time for another update and forecast on the Washburn fire. Last thing I saw, the fire activity was picking up. So throughout this video, we're just gonna see exactly where the fire is right now, where it's expected to go in the future, and then the fire weather forecast so we can determine what direction this fire is going to spread as we move forward. Now the first thing to do is just check out that map of where this fire is so we can get our bearings and see exactly what kind of threats are associated with this fire. Now the one that we've heard a lot about is the Mariposa Grove. And the reason that's a threat right now is because there's over 500 giant sequoias in this area. You can see it's almost this little cove that's been created by the fire right here. That's the Mariposa Grove. If you want to see what one of those giant sequoias looks like, I believe we could click on the photo of it right here. So you can see that. Very ancient trees. Some of these are over 2,000 years old. And before we actually get into the wildfire, I will say something pretty interesting about this that I'm actually going to make a news package about later today that I'll also upload to YouTube so you can see. But giant sequoias, right now we're hearing how they're being, they're under attack from fire and humans are wrapping the bases in foil to try to protect the trees. But something I was thinking about is, well, who protected them the last 2,000 years when they were, they were alive? And kind of the story of giant sequoias is that they're actually a fire-dependent species, meaning that they evolved with the fire regime of California. They actually have seeds inside of cones that don't get germinated until a fire comes through and clears out all that underbrush. Some of those seeds can actually stay dormant for 20 years until a fire comes through, clears out all the competing vegetation, and then that seed is able to sprout with all that open sunshine. Now another thing about giant sequoias, they actually have fire resistant bark that has something called tannin in it, and it's extremely thick. The other thing they do, if you look at this picture, you notice all the greenery is up above and they shed all their lower branches, and that's another f mechanism they've evolved to defend themselves against wildfire. Just because wildfire comes through, bumps into their fire resistant bark, doesn't really do all that much, and then all their leaves are, or needles, not exactly what, what you call them, but are nice and protected up here. Now why this situation has changed is because when you for, suppress fire for a very long period of time, you can get other trees like firs coming in here or brush, and that takes what is the natural ecosystem and turns it into something that these trees didn't evolve around, which is an area where you have ladder fuels that can actually, you imagine a fir tree right here, that catches on fire, then goes up into the canopy of the giant sequoia, destroys it that way, or there's just so much brush around that the fire burns so hot that it overwhelms the bark's natural defenses. So it's kind of a nuanced argument there, but these trees aren't technically under attack by fire. They're more under attack from the lack of fire, if you want to put it that way. But just an interesting thing. I'll do a more concise package about that later and update it here. But now let's just get into the fire. So again, that's one of the main things that we're watching right there, those 500 giant sequoias. Looks like we did get a little bit of growth in that area. The other spot that we're keeping a close eye on is the whole Wawona area. You can see it right there. And something that we can actually do on this map is turn off the last 24 hours growth. So we can see this is what it looked like during our video update yesterday. And this is what it looks like now. So you can see where that growth was. Remember yesterday, in yesterday's fire weather forecast, we were talking about how the winds were from a westerly direction or southwesterly, so we were expecting that growth to the northeast. And you can see that's what ended up happening. And if we zoom in here, it does look like there's some new spots that have come from those winds picking up burning embers, tossing them out ahead of the major blaze, and then starting new little fires. And that has been a major problem on this fire because you can just imagine how frustrating it is for firefighters where they just drop a bunch of great retardant right here. They're trying to stop the fire in its tracks and then one little burning ember gets picked up, dropped into these dry fuels and starts a little fire past those containment lines. Or I shouldn't say containment lines, but fire retardant lines that were designed to stop the fire. So again, one area we're watching is that Mariposa Grove right there. 
The other area, we'll see if we can flip this around so we can see. So here's North Wawona down here. And you notice how this fire has started to creep down the hill. So if you don't know, fires like to move uphill more than they like to move downhill. The reason for that is because the flames tilt against the vegetation and it's able to preheat the vegetation before it catches, so it just leads to faster spread. But during the nighttime hours, you get what's called downslope winds. Basically pushes this fire down this hill right there. And that's where we have seen some of that spotting. Looks like we did get one spot right there. I think that's in the watch duty report we'll look at in a second. But that has been pushing it a little bit closer towards that North Wawona area where there is the largest amount of structures that I would say are threatened by this fire. And we'll look at that when we look at the Cal Topo map. So again, that's the view of it. That shows where it has grown the last couple days. We can come back to that map in a second if we need it. But first, we'll just go to watch duty. Again, this is my new favorite app when it comes to this fire season. If you get this on your phone, what I did is I turned on all the counties around where I live. So it sends you a little notification if a fire pops up in your area. Very helpful. I wish I had an app like that when I lived in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Probably would have been a lot safer. But again, great thing to have right now. Or if you just want to follow the fires, they keep a great little timeline right here. So for example, July 10th, 2.14 a.m., 1,591 acres from mapping flight that took place around 10 p.m. tonight. I believe that's referring to the, the total growth on this fire. Again, total growth is going to be up here, 1,821 acres, 0% containment. So most recent update, so 9 a.m., they said it's at 1,821 acres, fire still wanting to back down to the Merced River and also move to the east slash northeast. So that goes along with what we were just seeing on that Google Earth imagery where it was moving towards the northeast and then also backing down. That's where a fire is moving downhill. And then 2.21 p.m. current view as of 2.18. Fire activity beginning to pick up this afternoon as the smoke begins to clear. Working on getting fixed wing and helicopters up now with clear conditions. Additionally, overnight, the fire did enter into Madera County, just south of the Merced River. So it's interesting that they say the fire activity is picking up right now. First place to always look at that is on the satellite imagery. If you notice, I'll go back to this morning on this. So going back to this morning, then we'll press play. Notice a lot of that smoke isn't moving very much. That, that tells you that the winds hadn't picked up all that much. But then it's in the more recent hours, you start to see that smoke move a little bit faster. And that's why it looks like there was more smoke early in the day, but it was just because we didn't have wind dispersing it. If you look closely, it does look like we're starting to get a bit more new smoke coming off this fire right now. now another thing we can do is actually just check out the live cameras to see what this looks like. And Definitely active throughout the morning hours. This is going to be a three hour time lapse right here. And then just as temperature picks up, your relative humidity starts to drop down. That's where the fire activity picks up as well. So it looks like we have two different areas where we're seeing the majority of this activity on that. So that's going to be interesting to look at when we check out the hot spots. Just want to see another view of this. Yeah, had some hazy conditions throughout the morning. And then that is one. Kind of good thing you could say when winds pick up, it clears the smoke out instead of leading to very bad air pollution in one place. It's dispersed medium bad air pollution over a larger area. And then just last shot right here that I want to see. So I like this shot because it shows a better angle of what these fuels look like in this area. If I zoom in here, you can see how dry a lot of these fuels are. And Somebody in the comments of the live chat yesterday asked kind of what my prognosis is for the overall wildfire season and how bad I think it's going to be. I think a good place to go for that is looking at the California U.S. Drought Monitor, where unfortunately you can see parts of California have stretched back into that exceptional drought category. And then 60% of the state is in that extreme drought category, and 97% of the state 
is in that severe drought category that's shown in that orange color right there. So reason that's important, the drier it is, the drier the fuels are, the drier the fuels are, the easier it is for fires to start. And then once those fires do start, it's easier for them to spread. So if I had to just give my official 2022 wildfire forecast, I would say it's likely, I wouldn't say it's likely, it's, eh, yeah, I'd say it's likely that we're going to burn above average acres this year. But I'm going to make the same claim that I made last year in that it won't be as bad as the 2020 wildfire season. The reason that 2020 wildfire season was so exceptionally bad was because of that crazy lightning storm that started hundreds of fires across the state, basically overwhelmed all our resources and led to multiple fires growing hundreds of thousands of acres. But if you look at the interval on an, on an event like that, it happens about every 20 years. I believe the first one was 1977 where lightning storms came through California, started hundreds of fires, overwhelmed our resources, lots of those fires grew. Then it happened again in 1999, and then it happened again in 2020. So as long as that interval stays the same, I think we are good in that regard until about 2040. But given the dry conditions out there with that California drought monitor, I do expect us to have above average growth throughout this year. Now what we can do is check out some of those active hotspots right now. So one thing that I notice about this is it shows kind of the impacts that topography is having on this fire. If we go back to this map, you can see that there are kind of hills on all sides of this fire. It's going uphill right there. It's going uphill right there. It's going uphill right there. So what that allows to happen is during the day, when you get those up canyon winds, it wants to push the fire up. During night, when you get those down canyon winds, it wants to push the fire down. So I think that's a big reason that when you look at the previous fire perimeter, and then where you see a lot of those little hot spots right there, they're not all in one direction. With some of our fires, you'll see the fire perimeter and then hot spots only on the northeastern section. This one has spread in every direction of the fire because of the nature of that topography and how the winds shift throughout the day and it's able to spread in different directions throughout the day because of that. Now if we want to zoom in to actually see where some of the active hotspots are right now, some of the more active ones, that's what that's the hotspots that we were just seeing on that other map. Again, as always, before I click what I'm about to click, I will say that this this map is made from satellite imagery, so it's not perfect, but it is the best that we have to kind of get a general idea of the direction that the fire is moving. So again, don't be too alarmed if it looks like the fire is just massive right here, but it does give us a good, good idea of how it's moving. And right there, it does tell us that it looks like this fire is spreading to the north. One other way we could kind of back up that claim is looking at the smoke imagery and if we come back, if we just fast forward to recent, notice all that smoke off the fire is traveling to the north. So that tells you the winds right now are coming from the south and the winds are going to try to spread that fire to the north. So it matches up well with that imagery right there. Now something else we can add on to this is the fire history. That's where some of the good news comes in. Right now the fire is being pushed towards the north but that is right where we have the 2017 South Fork fire, where this would have cleared out some of the fuels in this area. I don't exactly know how many of those fuels it cleared out or how effectively it reduced the fuel load in this area, but hopefully it at least reduced it somewhat and that'll help slow the growth compared to what we're looking at on this live shot right here, where it's just acres and acres of dead and dry vegetation. Now, one other thing we can do right here is, I'll turn off fire history so it's not too confusing. We can turn on structures where we can look at the key areas that we're concerned about right now. That area down there, let's, I believe that's the fish camp area. We'll just zoom out right here, get our bearings. 
Yeah, I believe that's the fish camp structures we're seeing right there on the south of the fire, North Wawona to the northwest of the fire. That's where that cluster of yellow dots is right there. That's fish camp, that's Wawona right there. I think the key area I'm concerned about is Wawona because of how those, where the fire spread has been recently. It has been more in that direction than the fish camp direction. But again, when we look at the fire weather forecast, winds can always change, so we'll see where we expect it to move in the coming days. But that's certainly the direction of most spread that we've seen to the north and northeast. Now, if we want to come back here, this is the InsaWeb website. This is also a great one for wildfire information. If I haven't put this in the link in the description, I'll make sure to do that after the video. But let's see if we have any new information here. Yeah, so it looks like of significant importance is preventing or minimizing fire impacting to the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias. Fire is burning in difficult terrain. That's something that we looked at. With continuous heavy fuels, that's what we saw in those live cameras, in and around the fire. Significant tree mortality from 2013 to 2015 has left dead standing and dead fallen trees. And that matches up well with what we see right there. Big reason for that. Hopefully I'm not getting too science-y throughout this update and forecast. I'll try to do a more concise one later. But big reason for that is, again, it actually comes back to um, fire suppression a little bit as well. And just the buildup of fuels over decades. When you get, let's say, 100 trees in this area that I'm circling right here, when the natural ecosystem would only be sustaining 20 trees, you have about 100 trees sharing that same amount of water, so they, each, they all get water stressed. Then on top of that, there's a drought, so then everything is water stressed. And then the trees get weakened, weakened, and then what's able to happen is pests and disease are able to come in and take advantage of these weakened trees. And that's why we do have a lot of tree mortality in this area. Now just coming back down here, it says Mariposa Grove was evacuated and remains temporary, cl temporarily closed. And... This is an area home to 500 mature giant sequoias. So personnel is up on this fire. That's some good news right there. We're up to 360. Believe they have to update that right there. Fuels involve timber and brush, mostly high load conifer litter with heavy dead and down component, as well as substantial standing dead. And then significant events, moderate fire behavior observed. That is one thing I'll say. Throughout all the videos we've seen, it certainly looks like it's picking up over the last hour or two, but it's, not like any of those fires that we saw last season or in 2020 just yet. Part of the reason for that, we're still pretty early in the season. It's usually around, I don't know, October, September, November, where all those fuels get exceptionally dry. And then you get some really big fires where the potential for large fire growth each day goes up. So weather concerns, this is kind of my department. See what this says right here. Heavy smoke from the Washburn fire will impact Yosemite Park this afternoon. Makes sense because if we look at where Yosemite Valley is, it is 30 miles to the north of this fire. I'll get us situated that way is north. You see Yosemite Valley up there. Half Dome is up right there. And then the winds were blowing this fire towards the north, so that's taking some of that smoke and blowing it into Yosemite Valley. Now, min relative humidity dropped to 28, 32%. That's actually not all that bad. My master's thesis, some of the research I've done on wildfire shows that it's a relative humidity of 17%, where you really, really, really 10,000 acres over a 24 hour period becomes much more likely. But downslope winds may push smoke into the Sierra Nevada foothills this evening into Sunday. And then warming trend is expected Sunday and Monday. So before we get into that full fire weather forecast, we can look at the projected incident activity. They expect the fire to keep growing moderately. So again, it's not ex a crazy fire yet. It's not one of those Dixie fires or Caldor fires just yet. Fires remain active overnight and will be expected overnight 24 hours. Warming and drying fire activity will increase throughout the day tomorrow. And then that's something that we can look at right here. We'll do our 
Little trick, you can do this as well. You take the latitude and longitude of the fire, put it into windy.com. It takes you exactly where that fire is. And then you can check out the forecast for this afternoon. Looks like moderately gusty winds around 20 to 25 miles per hour. Temperature, we're pretty close to where the high temperature of the day would be, 82 degrees right there. Humidity, looks like it's now dropping down more than that last report was showing, down to 21%. And then if we look at tomorrow, this I think is what I'm most concerned about because you notice that relative humidity dropping down into past that threshold that I was talking about. Temperature well above the threshold I identified of 75 degrees, 85 degrees throughout the day tomorrow. And then winds, looking at wind gusts, right around 25 miles per hour again. If we look at the direction, once again, looks like it's coming from the southwest. So once again, that's going to try to push the fire towards the northeast. Good for places like fish camp, bad for areas north of the fire, Yosemite Valley, which will get some of that smoke. And then we'll keep an eye on those downslope winds overnight to see if it pushes it closer towards Wawona. So if we actually want to see the smoke forecast today, not actually all that bad, just moderate. Kind of goes along with that satellite imagery right there. There's some smoke being produced, but not a crazy amount. And then forecast for tomorrow, very similar. If we want to see what that smoke actually looks like, in action. Yeah, it looks like as we get, I wish we could. Yeah, during the overnight hours, you notice how a lot of that smoke just sits over the fire. And then it's as you get to like 4 or 5 p.m. where the winds pick up that that smoke starts being pushed more. And then finally, Last thing that's probably the most important thing, so I probably should have shown it first, but this is where the current evacuations are. Again, I'm, I don't usually dive into these all that much, but I show it just so that you can see that this is a resource that's available. I put it in the link. I put the link to this in the description of the video just because most people don't watch these videos live. So don't take this map if you are watching this later, don't take this map as the current update. If I were you, I would go into the link into this in the description. Got to work on saying that. And then see what those current evacuation warnings and orders are. Can't say what the, it means though. The yellow is an advisory. Once you're in the red, that means it's a full-on warning and you have to evacuate immediately. So I have to start getting ready for the 6 o'clock news. But I'm planning on doing another concise update on this fire where I just summarize it in maybe one to two minutes. Don't dive into the science too much that I know you probably got too much of throughout this video. And then I'm also planning on doing a little package on giant sequoias and how they're fire dependent. So if you want to see all that, you can stick around and I'll be doing these wildfire update and forecast videos throughout this entire season and most likely for the next few decades. So thanks for watching. Hope that this video was helpful and I hope you have a good day.